it no longer matters culturally, culturally or legally, then the family is in, in very dangerous ground. Because if you cannot establish who belongs to who based on family relationships, then it blows the whole thing apart. And so, but you can see that the ideology of the early socialist feminists has marched forward in a very deliberate way and is now front and center. And what she said, though, that the end result of basically desexing the world, eliminating uh, the sexual differences from being culturally uh, important, would be the end of the family. In fact, more specifically, she says it will precipitate the disappearance of motherhood. Mm -hmm. So, but how did you find your way into the subject that you would be writing about it? I mean, there's a lot to write about, and it really is under attack, but how, what was mm -hmm. your path into that? Well, it happened somewhat accidentally. So what happened, what precipitated me becoming in, interested in this sphere at all, other than being mom, of course, was uh, one day, it was actually 10 years ago, um, I found some information online. I was doing some other study, and I ran across a document that was just utterly shocking to me. And what it was, was it was a, it was a document created by International Planned Parenthood Federation. And it was talking about the sexual rights of children. It was sexual rights for youth. Okay, and pause. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're not having trouble with your radio set. You just heard that. There are times I just have to say, excuse me, what? You know, you hear this, and you're saying this was 10 years ago. Right. And who was and this again? Who posted this? International Planned Parenthood Federation. Talking about yeah. the sexual rights of children. That's just diabolical. So please continue. So that's, that's the reaction that I had. I thought, wait, what? I, I didn't know this would be out there. You know, it was easily findable. It was one of their public documents. It's called the Exclaim document. And um, I, as I read it, you know, it's very beautifully done, and it talks about these 10 principles of sexual rights for, for youth. And I thought, this, this, can't, this can't be real. But I discovered that it was. And so then I thought, well, if it's real, I'm, I'm going to fight it. I'm going to spend the rest of my life, if need be, of fighting, fighting this agenda. And so what happened from there is I somewhat quickly and miraculously, by the grace of God, got involved with um, an organization that had been fighting this very issue, the children's sexual rights issue at the United Nations for several years. And so I, I you know, I felt like I'd found my calling and was able to join forces with them. And and I've spent the last 10 years uh, studying this, learning about it, attending the UN, and seeing for myself uh, how this agenda is being pushed forward. I mean, we have to go to the heart of it. This is Planned Parenthood pushing this. So anybody um, misinformed enough at this point uh, to think that Planned Parenthood is just trying to help women or whatever, they're pushing an agenda that does not just... Uh, include at its center uh, killing children in the womb. Uh, it, it is about an entire sexual revolution to upend what I and most people would see as God's natural order and his plan for families and children. But it becomes clearly diabolical when they're talking about children in a sexual way. And, mm -hmm. and that's, but of course that's where it goes. It takes time, it's taken decades. They wouldn't have dared said mm -hmm. this, you know, 10 years before, but suddenly, 10 years ago, boop, there it is on their website. And what, what interests me is that they're banking on the idea that they have enough capital with the people who believe in Planned Parenthood that they can float this and not get any blowback. Right. And what I've discovered is it's been going on even much longer than 10 years ago. Like one of the documents that the World Health Organization created in 1975 um, claims to have put in their de definition of sexual health even then that sexual pleasure is a right. Now, in that document, <laughs> that didn't say for youth, but uh, so let me give you an example yeah. from the document that, yeah. I, that I discovered. Yeah. So it's, one of their quotes is that they say, sexuality and sexual pleasure are important parts of being human for everyone, no matter what age, no matter if you want to be married or not, and no matter if you want to have children or not. And then they go on and they say, governments and leaders have a responsibility to protect and fulfill yeah. all sexual rights right. for everyone. Right. And you hear in there, there's no limitations on age. In fact, they say at all stages of life and for everyone. Yeah. That doesn't leave anybody out. And, and what I found is it's specifically aimed at youth. It, it's, they're targeting youth, and they say that they do that on purpose because if you, you know, influence someone in their youth, you influence them for their lifetime. Well, let's start with just with the title of your book. The book is The Invincible Family, Why the Global Campaign to Crush Motherhood and Fatherhood Can't 
win. So why do you say that it can't win? Well, that goes to the second piece of the book. So the, the first thing that brought me to the table was the children's sexual rights campaign, which I found very disturbing. And as a mom, <clears throat> excuse me, of several kids, I, I've come to believe that that womanhood, that motherhood specifically, is the most powerful position in the world. And I have reasons for saying that. And so um, what came to my mind is that, so if you, if you are aiming sex at, sex at children, you're essentially placing a bomb at the genesis of the family. Because sex is what creates families. It's what creates human life. And it's a gift from God and it's created by God for good, to bring his children to earth, to live. But if you teach a person in their youth that sex is simply their right, that they have a human right to experience sexual pleasure, apart from really any responsibility or intention, you, you've set a bomb at the, at the feet of the family, and you've set a person on a path that is, of course, not true and going to lead them to a great deal of personal pain and heartache, but you're also um, working to obliterate the family as the very core of civilization, which it is. So, Well, you see, you, I want to uh, just you know, add to that, just so people are tracking. Um, part of the deep, deep, deep dysfunction in our culture, this is going back... Uh, to the 60s, ultimately. In other words, it goes way before that, but, but it began in the 60s. It's the redefinition of sex. When people talk about your sex life, and you think, well, what is that? In other words, there was a time, it was from the beginning of time until recently, that there was really almost no such thing as sex. There was marriage. And then in marriage, the physical expression of love, which led to pleasure and children and family was, was sex. But something happened where people with a completely different agenda, different theology, different view of the human person said, we want to pull this out and away from God's mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. And of course, they've been working on that for a long, long, long time. And you know, you have Margaret Sanger and others, this is going, going way back. But it didn't really enter mainstream American culture till the 60s. Mm -hmm. I notice on the back of your book you have um, uh, encomia from Mary Eberstadt, Jennifer Roback Morris, uh, who are heroic in this world. But, you know, M Mary uh, Eberstadt, when she writes about, you know, the pill, that this technology came mm -hmm. into the world in 1961, whatever it was, that suddenly made it possible to divorce sex from children mm -hmm. and family and that's where it began. And we now have a number of generations that, that really don't see this holistically. They, they, when they, when they, they think about sex as this other thing. So mm -hmm. it, it becomes merely, it's like a sneeze. <laughs> it's, it's nothing to do with the heart, the heart of it, which is bringing human beings into the world. Right. And they've been quite successful at putting that version of uh, uh, that ideology forward. And, and what, what's interesting, so I, in my study for the book, I ran across the writings of a feminist from the early 1970s, Shalamath Firestone. And she came up with a, a very similar thesis to mine, but she comes at it from the opposite angle. So my belief, kind of the genesis of part of the book is that when, when a baby is born, it belongs to somebody. And it's always a mother. It's always a woman. Like when a baby is born, there's really no debate over who, whose baby it is. And so that's, that's significant. We kind of take that for granted. But God did it that way on purpose so that there would be private belonging. And so the whole system of life is based on private belonging. So there's, there's this kind of constant debate going in the world of should there be collectivism or should there be you know, privatization? And this is what wars are fought over, over, over and over again. And, um, but if you look at it closely at the anatomy that God has created, he's already decreed that privatization wins because it wins every time a child is born because the baby belongs privately to the woman. And hopefully, in in tandem with the man. Always there's a father involved and hopefully he's there holding her hand by her I, side and it creates a private institution that we call the family. But now because of surrogacy, uh, even that most basic thing is being challenged, that you can pay some woman and say, well, we, we, we want to have a baby, but we don't have a womb uh, because we're a gay couple, because this, because that. So we want to rent your womb. Mm -hmm. 
which uh, brings up all kinds of ethical problems. Uh, do, do you talk about right. that at all? I do spend a chapter on that in the book. And anything, anything that severs or tries to sever the relationship of the mother to her own child, we have to be very cautious of that. We have, that has to be suspect. And so if you look at what has been said about the relationship of mothers, like Shalamath Firestone, an early feminist from the 1970s, she, she said, she said the reason why socialism has not worked so far, either on the mi micro or the macro level, she pinpointed it. She said that's because we haven't been able to eliminate the belonging of certain babies to certain mothers. And she said, as long as we have natural childbirth methods, where a mother is pregnant, births the, births the baby, and then it belongs to her, she says, as long as we have that, socialism can never be fully enacted. See, that is, I've that. never heard that. That's really interesting, because right? that makes sense. It's so foundational that, um, yeah, if somebody wants to redefine all of reality and say, okay, we're, it's going to be collective now, all children belong to the state, mm -hmm. the problem is that because of God's design, almost all mothers will have this deep, deep, deep connection to the child that they gave birth to. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's really no way around that. Right. And that's intentional. And that's what God's creates, design. There's yes. just no way around and it. So it creates private belonging, first of all, and then it puts children who are helpless in the care of other people, their parents. And then what usually happens is in caring for someone else, you love them. Like there's an inherent love that usually comes when a baby is born, but then as you serve your child, which is demanded upon you day after day as parents, that's where the love begins to happen. So it, it puts the world on a track to, to love. And really, through the anatomy that God has designed, the world is established on the love of mothers and fathers. And it's interesting because Firestone also said, she said, if you... If a mother gives birth to a baby and labors for nine months and, and births the baby, she's going to feel like that baby belongs to her. And you know what Firestone said? She said, we want to destroy this possessiveness. Wait, so that, so, that is so the, the feminist who, who is That's talking about this was the, ultimately the enemy of this, you're saying? Yes. So she pointed out that fact and said, therefore, since we, from her opinion, since we all want global socialism, then we have to hack away yeah. at the connection between okay. mothers and Well, see, and this babies. is interesting because I've yeah. always known, you, you know, we, we, we know these things in part, where you, you know that any big state... Uh, philosophy, whether it's, you know, Soviet communism or uh, 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 Chinese communism or the Nazis or whatever, whoever it is, they are at ultimately at war with God's order, mm -hmm. which includes the family. And so that's the, that's the fundamental problem. And so they want to destroy all of God's order. So you want to destroy the family. You want to destroy the concept of marriage. Mm -hmm. All of these beautiful things are created by God, they're uh, woven into the warp and woof of reality, but when you're at war with reality and the God of reality, these are the things you go after. And so this is what they've mm -hmm. been doing, and you're giving us a piece of, of how that happened in the 70s. That's, I, I've never heard that before. Right, and so it's, it really is significant. So when, when I read that that was her philosophy, I said, wait, that's my philosophy. But my answer is totally different than hers. Hers is, therefore, we have to cut the bond between mothers and babies, and mine is, therefore, that's the thing we have to preserve at all costs. And the thing is, it's pretty hard to break. That's why the title of the book is The Invincible Family, because if you're going to truly break the family and do it permanently, right. you have to break motherhood, which is nearly impossible because it's nearly invincible. So, you know, we've got reproductive te technologies now attempting to do this. And in fact, Firestone said that her first objective her, for humanity was to eliminate the bearing of children by mothers. So that's, that's a tall order, but you see that we're marching in that direction, and people are beginning to accept that way of thinking yeah. and, and technologies that would facilitate it. Right, which I, I think, I have to think that we are very, very far from synthetic wombs. Like, I, I, when people talk about that, it's like talking about, you know, artificial intelligence developing consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's like, 
I don't think it could ever happen. Like, I just don't. I think that it's just chatter. Like, people well, say even, these things. Well, even it happened, if it happened on a limited basis, it would never be the solution for humanity. It would never be a widespread solution because, you know, the way God designed it happens a lot more effectively and easily, you know, through, through sex and childbearing. And, and so it's really not, you know, uh, false childbearing is not going to take over the world. But the ideology behind it, is uh, that is what's marching forward? Oh, there's no doubt about that. No, there's no there's no doubt about that. But um, it, it is interesting too how I never saw it coming. But uh, I remember when you know same sex marriage became the quote unquote law of the land, which to me again mm-hmm. talking about marriage beyond a man and a woman for life. I redefining marriage. You you can't actually redefine marriage. You can do it in this sort of. Uh, it, it becomes sophistry. It's like redefining sex, redefining mm-hmm. whatever. You're, you're just basically carving out these words and giving them the meaning. But when that happened, um, we, we kind of leapt quickly to the trans thing. And when we come mm-hmm. back, I want to talk about that because that's become the enemy of womanhood. So uh, don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. So the transgender movement kind of leaps sort of from nowhere. I mean, I really mm-hmm. found it so bizarre. Um, and it is the more bizarre to my mind that it has become the enemy of women. Uh, it, it, it's just an extraordinary thing. You, you, I just feel like you see the, the radical anti-God left eating its own. I mean, one, mm-hmm. one minute it's, it's all about women, the next minute it's destroying the concept of womanhood. It's so interesting, and I spend a chapter on that in the book. And it's really been ingenious the way that this has been put forward because LGBT, they were all put in one package, right? And when you look closely, they're not at all the same. They are divergent ideologies that lead in different directions. They're both family destructive, but in different ways. Like, you know, the the argument behind uh, for same-sex marriage is being born that way. So even if you believe that that belief, um, the other argument, the argument for transgenderism is very different. It's that I was born in the wrong body, that my body is wrong. So they so have warring the, ideologies, yes. but they don't want to acknowledge it because they happen to be working together for, for the season. Yes, but the thing is, some, some groups and individuals yes. are coming out yeah. from the, these divergent communities saying, you know what, no, this isn't, this isn't our fight. These arguments right. aren't the same. And it's very, it's very destructive because, on the one hand, the arguments for same-sex marriage and so forth uh, seek to obliterate the fact that the sexes are compatible with each other, you know, and are made to cooperate with one another. But transgender, transgenderism takes it a step farther, and it wants to say that male and female don't exist at all. Not just that they're not complementary, but they actually don't exist at all, yeah. which, which is destructive of, of reality. It is not true. And, but once you dig into it, once you lean in that direction, start to believe that, then you're led down a, a path that is not based in physical truth. Well, th- this is the thing. To me, in other words, I, I, I don't know if I have put it this way before, but I, I sort of touched on it earlier. All of these ideologies are at war with reality. They're at war with nature and nature's God. They mm-hmm. are at war with God's idea of what a human being is, what a woman is, what a, what a, what a man is, uh, what a family is. And we need to at least acknowledge that. In other words, that, mm-hmm. that these ideologies are trying to deconstruct these things put in place by God, and they are at war with God. There's no mm-hmm. argument to be made. In other words, unless you say, look, I'm an atheist, there is no reality. We are just uh, products of accident. We can do whatever we want. There is no overarching reality or model to which we need to conform. We can do anything we like. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if you want to believe that, you can believe that, but don't, nobody should be fooled to think that that is somehow compatible with faith in the God of the Bible, because mm-hmm. he has given us clear orders of life, family, male, female. And that's what's so fascinating to me is how you have various fronts at war w- with this. But at the end of the day, they're mm-hmm. all at war with God, with what God says. And with, with the family. And so if you look again to the writings of, of Firestone, she went a step further than saying that we should eliminate the bond between mothers and babies. She said that the, the ultimate goal is not the elimination of what she calls male privilege, but the elimination of the sex distinction itself. 
And she said that in 1970. And she said that the result of eliminating the sex distinction itself, in, in her words, that sex would no, the sex of a, a body would no longer matter culturally. So if it no longer matters culturally, culturally or legally, then the family is in, in very dangerous ground. Because if you cannot establish who belongs to who based on family relationships, then it blows the whole thing apart. And so, but you can see that the ideology of the early socialist feminists has marched forward in a very deliberate way and is now front and center. And what she said, though, that the end result of basically desexing the world, eliminating uh, sexual differences from being culturally uh, important, would be the end of the family. In fact, more specifically, she says it will precipitate the disappearance of motherhood, which she rejoices in. And that's an interesting point, because if you think about it, if we can no longer define people by their physical sex, if they're male or female, if that becomes socially inappropriate or even illegal, uh, you know, veering in that direction, then it, very, it comes, becomes very problematic and difficult to define what a mother is, because mother is a sex-specific designation, as is father. So if, we, if we're not allowed anymore to designate people by male and female, then, then, then it becomes very hard to say who is a mother and who is a father, which is exactly the intention. Well, the title of the book is The Invincible Family, Why the Global Campaign to Crush Motherhood and Fatherhood Can't Win. So you're this week at the UN. It is a global <clears throat> campaign, and it fascinates me. The reason I see it as ultimately diabolical is it doesn't make any human sense. Why would so many people around the world be wanting to do these things? It's very mm -hmm. creepy and curious. Well, I mean, if you have totalitarian aims, if you think your ideas are the best and you want to rule the world, there's a great obstacle you have to overcome. And that's the family, right. because it's practically invincible, because it's built into our very beings. And so, you know, it's been said that the thing that stands between the totalitarian state and the individual is the family. And so that's where all the firepower is going. And they're having some success. And in fact, globally, you know, just I'm here at the United Nations this week, and it's stunning to see what they're enacting and how they're going about it. What do you mean? Give us some examples. Well, so I mentioned International Planned Parenthood Federation earlier. And so they partner regularly with UN agencies, UNESCO, you know, UNICEF, UNFPA, all these agencies. And they sponsor events, at, like the events that I'm going to this week, um, on sexual rights for women. And also they talk about it in, in relation to youth. And so this is an open uh, agenda that they push forward. The World Health Organization is also on board with this agenda. I'll give you an example that happened yesterday in a meeting that I was in at the UN. Um, after a presentation, actually it was a high school student, raised their hand to ask a question. And she said, uh, because we're talking about digital, uh, the digital divide, so-called, between yeah. men and women, how to bridge yeah. that divide. And that's a huge push for the UN right now. Anyway, this, this girl raised her hand and she said, um, I've seen a lot of promotion of sex work as a viable life choice, basically yeah. prostitution. prostitution. Yeah. And she said, I'd like to know what you think um, about, about that. Okay. This is called a cliffhanger in show business. <laughs> More uh, on that when we come back. The book is The Invincible Family. Kimberly Ells is my guest. And uh, she wanted to know what the powers that be thought about that. And interestingly, they didn't answer the question. And it, they can't answer the question publicly because the World Health Organization, which is a United Nations entity, they, they are in favor of legalizing sex work. If you go to decriminalizesex.work, their logo is huge as life under supporters of the cause of decriminalizing sex work. This and is the so, World Health Organization that yeah. was trying to give us advice about the vaccines 10 minutes ago. I mean, listen, their worldview is as antithetical to what most human beings on this planet believe. It's fascinating that these elites gather to promote this agenda. And so the answer that the meta person eventually did later in the thing, she said that, she said, well, we want to remain sex positive on the social media platforms without veering into basically the realm of abuse. Well, that's, so that's very tricky. Yeah, we don't want to be pimps on the web. We will be, I'm sure, to some extent, but we, we want to veer away from that. I right. mean, there's no way around this. So, so they, the, the, the feeling is they want to be, quote, sex positive. Okay, well, I'm sex positive. 
What does that? Yeah. What does I'm, that mean? I'm positive <laughs> that marriage, that sex should occur in marriage. Yeah. That's what I'm positive about. Yeah. And only in marriage. Yeah. And that it's a good thing when it happens in marriage. <clears throat> but anyway, the powers that be, you know, don't don't go along with that line of thinking at all. They want to present sex as a right, a human right, apart from any other thing. And it's just the most destructive thing. But you also have to ask why. In other words, wh- where do you get that from? Promoting sex or sexual pleasure as a right. You want to say, okay, nice idea. Where does that come from? Ideologically, what are the roots of that? And what is the reason for that? Well, there's a couple reasons. And one is one is one purpose is of course to destroy the family, to lay a bomb at the genesis of the family, which is sex. The other thing is Planned Parenthood Federation is trying to make your child a client because they need young people to be having sex so that they'll get into the predicament of having an unsupported pregnancy, an unmarried pregnancy, then they, so they can, of course, charge for abortions, they can charge for sexual disease testing, and now, of course, they've got on, gotten on the bandwagon of providing testosterone and estrogen treatments for transgender people. And so it's insidious. Are there transgender people? That's even another question. For people who think that they're in, trapped in the wrong body, but you're telling me that Planned Parenthood figures like, hey, there's a, we can make a good buck there as well, is, so they're getting into the this. New, oh, yes. This is the new cash cow for Planned Parenthood. So this whole thing advances their business model. and it, it Because Planned Parenthood Federation is the largest purveyor of what's called comp- comprehensive sexuality education in the world. And so they're in our schools teaching our kids that this is the paradigm I, of sex. 